Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and on behalf of the Dean and Chapter, welcome to Liverpool Cathedral. My name is Canon Mike, the organiser of these lectures, and it's a delight to welcome you to this uh, in-person Gilbert Scott Lectures on Science and Faith, the third one that we've had this month. So very glad that you've all made it tonight. I see some unfamiliar faces, so for those that uh, this might be your first time, this lecture series is entitled in honour not of the famous Giles Gilbert Scott, but actually his brother, Dr. Sebastian Gilbert Scott, who was a nationally and internationally renowned physician and radiologist in London. I started the series in 2019, which marked the 140th anniversary of his birth in Hampstead in 1879. His obituaries at the time in the medical journals highlighted his many clinical accomplishments as a radiologist, but also spoke about how good a teacher he was, teaching by example through a kindly, cheerful, and optimistic manner with his patients to many a young trainee radiologist. Our series, therefore, is designed so we have a wide range of speakers who share their thoughts and experiences in much the same way. And as a place of encounter, we feel this and all our events and concerts and services at the cathedral are together opportunities to encounter the God of love in all its fullness. For more information, please take a look at our dedicated webpage. The link is there on the uh, information sheets under your chair. As you know, these lecture series are always completely free, and as you know, these are quite challenging times, and there's costs always to uh, cover with these evenings. So might I gently ask for you to consider giving a donation in the baskets at the end, if you can, really. Um, it would be very much appreciated. And finally, before we get on to the really interesting part of this evening, please also consider filling in the feedback, the evaluation sheets. That's so important to us. Uh, it's, made, it's made very simple, there's just three very simple questions there, but it gives us good feedback in terms of what you think of the lecture or the series, but also what you might want to hear in the future. So, without further delay, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Reverend Deacon Paul Rooney. Paul is an award-winning senior lecturer in the Department of Geography and Environmental Science at Liverpool Hope University. He's also a permanent deacon and assistant director for the permanent diaconate in the Archdiocese of Liverpool, and a member of the national executive for the permanent diaconate. As well as all this, he's also a member of the Society of Catholic Scientists. I first heard Paul and of his work on BBC Radio Merseyside on the Breakfast Programme, and it was a delight to recently record a short podcast with Paul, where I learnt much more of his great work. I know we're in for a really interesting lecture tonight from, by his own description, the Dune Nerd. Everyone, would you please welcome Reverend Paul Roo. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to come and uh, address the um, gathering tonight in this beautiful location. Uh, this is spectacular. I hope my talk lives up to the, um, the surroundings. Um, it's a particular pleasure to come and address you here um, as a Catholic art, uh, deacon and um, someone who works at the Liverpool Hope University. I did my first degree at the Liverpool Hope University and I've worked there since 1999. Before that, I even met my wife there. So it's a really important part of my life. And its Christian foundation is uh, really important to me and my family, um, and particularly that it's fully Anglican and fully Catholic. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here and contribute to our ecumenical endeavours in and around Liverpool. Um, so, yeah. Coastal dunes. Um, has anyone not been to the coast? Has anyone not been to the coast? I've only had, and I've only, had, only once did I have uh, hands go up then, and I realised it was two brand new international students of ours from Nepal. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm glad that you've uh, all been to the coast. And as Mike says, I, I'm a self-confessed 
sand you nerd. Okay, that's exactly what I am. I've got, I make no bones about it. Um, that's my uh, that's my bet. And what I'm going to try and do tonight okay, in this um, address is to tell you a little bit about sand dunes, um, but um, to intersperse that, to weave through it just some questions about faith, to use a lot of analogies to maybe say, well, here's how sand dunes work. How does that apply to your faith? Might, might that be useful to, to prompt you? The natural world is fantastic. God's creation, we see God and everything around us. And we see that, I see it, in coastal sand dunes. Well, let me tell you a little bit about myself first. To give you a little bit of context to where I'm coming from with this um, coastal dune thing. Okay. So, this was me on our first ever family holiday. In, uh, it was in uh, Pontins. Okay. And I was insistent that I needed to have a hat a holiday hat. And you can see, it's a captain's hat. I've always had something about the coast and the sea. So there's me on the holiday, the, the early days, being interested in the coastal environment. Then, years later, we holidayed um, quite regularly in a caravan in a place called Saundersfoot in South Wales. If anyone knows, it's not far from Tenby. And we had lots and lots of really happy family holidays down there. And I got really quite interested in the coast. And we met uh, the people who they owned a caravan on the site, um, Wilf and, uh, and Betty Hazelden, right? They owned a caravan on, on the site. Um, and we became great friends. And they were people of great faith as well. My family were Catholics and they were Anglicans. And um, we got on like a house on fire. Now, my interest in the coast was really formally fired up because um, Mrs. Hedge, as we called her, bought me a book. Bought, bought me a book. And here it is. This book's really precious to me. Uh, Creatures of the Bay. And this really inspired my interest in the coast. And I'll just read out. In here, so I must have been about six or seven years old, I kept the note from Mrs. H. Where she says to me, Dear Paul, I thought you, might, you would like this little book. I hope it will remind you of your holiday when you read it during the winter. Next year we'll be able to look for some of the things when you come back to Salter's. God bless and love Mrs. H. So that kind of was a real first trigger for me to be interested in the coastal environment. And I suppose when we think about our faith as well, people can be very influential, can help them trigger you, can help you along the way. Mrs. H did that for me about the coastal environment. So, the years went on, um, I'm interested in the coast, but it's a little bit unfocused. I decided to go and take um, um, a degree, first one in our family. And I went to what is now Liverpool Hope University. And we went away on field work in the first year. <coughs> we own a, a spectacular field centre uh, on the banks of the Mouth Estuary of Snowdonia National Park between Barmouth and Dolgathlin, if you know it. It's called Place Cardinian, which means place of the Dean. Okay, place of the Dean. Charles Darwin lived there for a while, so it's a really inspirational setting. But whilst we were there, we went out on field work to this site. Does anyone know where that is? It's a classic first shot uh, view from the National Trust site at Cliff Edge. Down over this dune system, it, it's more for Harlech, Harlech Castle, it's just off to the right. Um, and you can see the mountains of the Clean Peninsula in the distance. We 
went there and we did some field work. And it was absolutely wonderful. Out on the dunes, the guy called Mike Alexander, the warden, and Mike Shooters as well. I was inspired by this wonderful natural environment. And here's a picture of me on that trip. Okay, here's a picture of me there, 18 years old. Which one am I? Any guesses? Any guesses? Which the lean in the on this one? No, no. That one? No, two a lot. Ah, yes, you got it right. That one's me. I only put this in to show that I actually had hair at that point. <laughs> <laughs> so there I was a young, 18-year-old, enthusiastic environmentalist, and fired up going out into the natural environment, into this wonderful place. Called the Morpha Harlech on the dunes there. And like at the coast, I'm saying, wow, sand dunes are just fantastic. Sand dunes are just fantastic. So at the end of the degree, um, my um, tutors literally took me by the elbow, literally, and said, You've got to go and do a higher degree. I said, No, I don't want to do one at the moment. Um, I want to go and be a coastal ranger. A Land Rover and a chainsaw, and I want loads of sand in my pockets. And that's exactly what I did. I was appointed as one of the first four permanent coastal rangers for Sefton Coast Management Schemes on the Sefton Coast, just north of Liverpool here. Um, and I spent some years working up there, um, starting off as a ranger and ended up running a um, a large European project working on the strategy on the coast and doing lots of nature recovery actions. And there were really happy years out there in the dunes, working away uh, there um, and being immersed in this wonderful nature of, 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 of the sand dunes and getting to understand how the coast worked. I used to take in storms. I used to take, make sure to get all. I ended up as like the kind of the boss there, the senior ranger. And everyone went, but when it was stormy, the rangers all wanted to, and the volunteers to stay inside and have a cup of tea. No, 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 no. You're all going to come out, put goggles on, put a mask on, you're going to go out into the dunes. The sand to be blowing round everywhere, so whipping your hands. So these are the times when you get to understand sand dunes, how things move. The, the, the turbulent, difficult times, that's when you really understand the place. Isn't that a little bit like our lives? Isn't that a little bit like our faith? Those times of test, those times of extreme weather in life bring you into sharp focus and you get to understand things a little better. So in January 1999, I jumped ship and joined what is now Liverpool Hope University on a nine month contract. HR haven't caught up with me yet. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so whilst there, I've done all the things that an academic kind of is expected to do. Written books, publish papers, go to conferences, um, explore the, um, the, 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 the academic area, create new knowledge, create new understanding. That's interesting again in terms of our faith, because sometimes we have to do, we have to study, we need to read, we need to step back, um, we need to write perhaps, maybe not an academic journal, maybe not as a theologian, but Chris and the others say, but maybe a reflective journaling, you know, a prior prayer life, recording times, thinking about things. That's great. So this academic sitting in the audience here today, this is nothing unusual for an academic. But what I think is really interesting and a bit that I'm particularly <coughs> pleased about in the work we've done in Coastal Dunes is taking that academic 
understand it, creating new knowledge, pushing the boundaries a bit, going to slightly dangerous places, unlike the paper at the moment, which is very controversial, challenging some ideas, the like coastal dunes. Um, but it's sharing that experience, it's taking it out there to the people. So one of the things I did, back in 2006, I established the sand dune and shingle, shingles just like big sand, okay, um, sand dune and shingle network. And that's all about sharing experience between academics and practitioners, practitioners and academics, and bridging that gap. Because there is a gap. I'm trying to bring that understanding together. Why? For the betterment of this fantastic landscape of coastal dunes. But also producing things of the website called the Sands of Time website, which was specifically aimed at A level students, geography, biology, first year undergraduates, to try and help them along the way, because they're going to be the future decision makers, the future um, uh, managers, the future academics. So working with people, working with people and translating that what we call knowledge exchange has been really important in my work, my work in the coastal environment. It's all about people in the end. Well, not all about people, but it's centuries use the term don't we? people of God. So you've got to work you can't just block yourself away. You need to go out there and proclaim the message. Go out there and proclaim the message. Go into areas that maybe are not so comfortable for an academic to go out and talk to a golf course manager. It could be uncomfortable, probably for both of them. But that's what we aim to do. I'm a geographer. So I'll first show you a map, number one. Okay. And this is a map of something we did with one of our visiting professors, Matt Doody, um, where we looked at where sand dunes are around the continent of Europe. And you can see these little yellow blocks where coastal dunes are. Here we are in northwest England on the Sefton coast. Lots of them obviously in the Netherlands, Denmark around Bordeaux, around the Black Sea, where all that conflict is at the moment. You can see that these, we can map these dunes out, and each of those dune areas are subject to their own local, national legislation. We're not in Europe anymore, so we're in the, in the EU, so slightly different tracks that were going on now. Um, but the nature doesn't recognise any of them. Because if we look at a different map, and this one is a nature map. These are the biogeographical regions. These are nature's area. So if you go from the tip of Denmark through the Low Countries, Netherlands, Belgium, France, down to northern Spain, the northern tip of Portugal, and the whole of the British Isles. Nature is as a commonality there that transcends national boundaries. Nature doesn't, understand, doesn't recognize our artificial lines that human beings have created. Isn't that interesting to think about in terms of ecumenism? The lines that we create. And yet, we have a commonality between us all. What do you need to form a sound dune? So, it's a basic requirement. The title of my talk was sand, wind and water. Sand, wind and plants, sorry. So, but sand is the basic requirement. You ain't gonna have a sand dune if you've not got sand, right? If you want a sand dune, you've gotta have sand. If you want a 
mine for gold. There has to be gold there. And a mine for diamonds. I've got coal. There has to be coal there. Or diamonds. If you want to sand you, you need sand. Where does sand come from? Well, in this part of the world, the sand comes from the products of glaciation. We had two miles of ice above part of this part of Britain, you know, in the Lake District in North Wales. And that ice ground the rocks down into small bits. And the fluvial action, the refraction of rivers over the years, washed that material out into the marine environment. And then waves and currents move it near shore. We wouldn't have sand dunes if we, we don't have sand. So sand's really important. <coughs> but it's also really annoying, isn't it? You've been on the beach, where you, know, you get sand in your butties, right? It's awful. And you come home, and you get, you, know, you, you get out there, and you've got sand in between your toes, and you're finding it in your pockets for ages. I had a guy who came round to our house once, you know, these vacuum um, cleaner demonstration guys, right? Because before I was married, I was living in this house on my own, uh, and it was a bachelor. And he said, um, do you want a vacuum demonstration because we're day off? So I said, yeah, why not? Right. <laughs> he came in and he vacuumed. I thought it was great. He went around and vacuumed the house, right, around the hall and the front room and the back room. And he kept saying, you've got an awful lot of sand in your house. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it can be annoying. And then you can see a little um, um, extract from a poem um, which is in through the looking glass. Uh, it's a poem, it's a, it's a third or fourth stanza, uh, which is um, said by it's the fourth, you know, by Tweedledum and Tweedledee to Alice in Alice in the Looking Glass, and how it'd be better if there wasn't any sand there. Okay. Sand gets a really bad press. Sand dunes have got a really bad press over the years. Problems with sand drift blowing in, blocking railway lines. Got going in, um, over buildings, sometimes even churches. There's a famous one, Scale, in uh, Denmark, which a big sand dune overwhelmed the church and they've uncovered it. It's a national monument now. So it gets a bad press. And sand, all, sand dunes also, in tradition, were seen as wastelands, places of little or no value, <coughs> places to be built on, places to be improved, places to be improved. So some of my work over the years, there's a couple of papers that I've written, written over the years, has tried to challenge that understanding of uh, sand dunes being wastelands, places that don't hold much value at all. We had, when you think of sand dunes and like a bare sand around the place, we had a, um, in fact, my Kids, but we had a, a, a diaconal retreat recently um, where all our deacons we went away um, as we do every year and have a, a, a retreat. And the retreat leader gave us a handout and just there's a little line that um, I, I pick out about thinking about this. It says, on raised land, life breaks through stubbornly yet invincibly. This is a little bit like sand dunes. They might be bare, raised land. Places where you might think that they're wasteland, valueless, but life breaks through stubbornly and invincibly. Sand. It's important. You can define sand in many different ways. Sand is actually just a description of particle size, 0.2 to 2 millimeters, it's a particle, it can be made of lots and lots of different things. Sand is just a particle size. But what about sand in the Bible? You know, has anyone ever looked up sand in the Bible? I'm sad enough as a sand you may to have done this, right? And it, it varies, but there's, there's 70, 80 references to sand in the Bible, right? And here's just some of them. So, Job saying, I shall multiply my days as sand. A multitude of quails provided for the Israelites. The psalmist saying, there are more in number than the 
the Son. The references to sand in the Bible almost exclusively refer to countless multitudes, because there's so many grains of sand on a beach. Countless multitudes. But there's also an interesting one in Matthew, this reference to instability. You know the, 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 the parable of the wise and foolish builder, the person who builds their rock house on rock and the person who builds their house on sand. Don't build your house on sand. Don't tell that to the people in form being in town. <laughs> <laughs> their house is all built on sand. Um, well, it's an interesting one because that notion of instability is seen in a context of sand as a bad thing. Is it really? Well, when we think about coastal dunes, it's not at all. And I'm going to return to that at the end. If you think about sand just as a, as a resource, it's super important. Do you know, in terms of our natural resources that we use, sand is the second most important natural resource on this earth behind water. It's astonishingly important. We're surrounded by sand. It's in all kinds of everyday products, even in toothpaste, paper, asphalt, sand is an integral part of our modern lives. It's an integral part of our modern lives. What we could say, it's fair to say that actually our entire society is built on sand. The wise or foolish builder. And actually sand is hugely overexploited. There's lots and lots of illegal mining going on all around the place, dredging, and sand has got particular qualities, and we're facing a resource crisis with sand. Something that is essential to our modern day lives. Isn't our faith in God essential in our modern day lives? Is that perhaps in our society something that's under threat? So, the world is actually facing a shortage of sand. That's a real natural resource problem. Okay, so just for a moment, metaphorically, I want you to get your walking boots out. Okay. We're going to go for a good old stomp through the dunes. Okay. We're going to have a little, just a little bit of, I can't do that for real, of course, because um, we have another time, um, but we're going to go for a little walk through the dunes. But before we go, there's just a little bit of background. Okay. This is a, a, like an aerial view looking down on a sand dune. You would find it just this at Aitersdale, just north of here at Liverpool. And this is a cross section. Okay. So what we can see is that the youngest dunes are usually the highest and most coherent in one piece. These dunes. The older landward dunes, the ones at the back of the dune system, that might be on the southern coast, if any of you know it, like Southport, Ainsdale, Northport, Hillside, Birkdale, etc. They're less, um, usually lower and more complex. They're broken up, right? but still sand dunes. Things have happened to them over the years. There's more sand supplies to the younger dunes because they're close to the beach. That's the, that's the supply of sand. The older dunes at the back don't get quite as much sand. But eventually the, the, uh, the, 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 these coherent floating dunes break up because it's the action of wind on them. Aeolian transport moves the sand. Right? The wind-driven systems, aeolian systems, move them around and then break up the sand dunes in things called blowouts. What golf course bunkers really were originally blowouts. 
And they can form at any part of these blowouts, they can form in any part of the system. That's interested in our faith as well. When you arrive in your faith, first of all, it's, it's easy, maybe big and coherent and certain and growing. But as you get older and more experienced, it gets a little bit more worn, and maybe it's still jubilant, it's still great, it's still really fantastic. But you've taken the knocks along. So these sand dunes are wind-driven systems. If you go out onto the beach on a windy day, you see this cloud of sand moving across the beach. Have you ever seen that? If you're on trying to in a storm driving a land rover into the wind, it's really, really weird. It looks like it's so you're doing 30 miles an hour on the speed up, it looks like you're not moving at all. It's really quite odd. Right? So that wind that drives the, the, the sand of the beach. The sand's really important. Maybe we're the sand, and maybe that driving force for us, especially as we're coming up this week to Pentecost, it's the Holy Spirit. The thing that drives us forward, well, the Holy Spirit that drive, takes us out there, drives, baptize, make me convert, talk to people, witness. That's the driving force in our faith. Wind is the driving force. It's sand dunes. Without wind, you don't have sand dunes. Either in the desert or on the coast. But what makes the dunes happen? It's this thing called surface resonance. That, that blowing sand of the beach hits something. An old bottle. Um, maybe bits of vegetation or bits of fence. And what happens is the wind blows through, right? And, the back, and those obstacles create what we call surface roughness. It slows the wind down. It actually creates a zone of still air at the bottom. And the sand gets deposited. And it's good. And the sand dunes build up. Because things slow down, and because there's a, 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 an area of stillness, that we need to do that in our lives with our faith. Stop, slow down, and have moments of stillness. And that's good. So here we are on a little stop through the dunes. And we're going to go from the beach and we're going to go through these habitats in a line going by. And we can start off with what we call the embryo dunes, the baby dunes. This is where you get a, a growing or accreting coast. You see distinctive coloured grasses there, some lime grass, some, some cooch grass, this beautiful glaucous colour, waxy leaves. Because it's a hard place to grow. It's hot, it's cold, it's salty, it's windy, it's just mineral sand, any water comes out, it just disappears. It's a tough place to be. And yet things thrive. On raised land, life breaks through stubbornly, yet invincibly. At this time of year, if you go up to the coast, you'll see this, you can make it out. A beautiful plant just starts to come out, sea rocket, with mauve flowers, and big seeds that float around in the sea and get washed up, and it grows along the strong land, these embryo dunes. And later in the, little bit later in the year, you start to see our ashes, kind of like arrow-shaped leaves. Um, and these are really interesting places. These are really, these plants are ad adapted to live in these challenging conditions. On raised land, life breaks through, stubbornly yet invincible. We go into the yellow dunes and the four dunes. These are the big dunes that you see. You know those that spiky grass, marrow grass? That's the big dew building plant in the northern hemisphere, Mophila arenaria, marrow grass. It loves having passan piled on top of it and it thrives on that. It grows up and through, sends out roots, and it's fantastically adapted. If you get look at the inside of a leaf and open it up, you'll see ridges and lines in it. And if you look at it in a cross section of an electron microscope, you see these ridges. And the stone manometer, the breathing holes of the plant, are buried 
it's down in those little ridges. It's specially adapted to thrive in this challenging environment. Maybe that's like us from within our faith. All of us have our own charisms, our own gifts. Some will be great as a school chaplain. Some will be great as a, as a, as a mother, a father, a priest. You're adapted, given like those gifts, to thrive in what would for other, other organisms to be a challenging situation. You move through to the, in the line here to the grey genes. This is where the mangrove starts to lose its hold. It's not uh, as vigorous. And other plants start to come in. We start to get uh, lots of other herbaceous plants, herbs coming in. It's more floristically rich. It's not as mobile. It's a little bit more stable. It's a little bit... Um, the environmental stresses are reduced. Then we come to this area, these ones, the dune slack. This is a little bit of water. This time of year, the water table varies, goes up and down seasonally. This time of year is quite high. And in these dune slacks, these valleys in between the dunes that flood, this is where you get a lot of specialists. This is the biodiversity hotspots on the dunes. This time of year, you're finishing now, you get to know what that is. And that's a jack toad. That's a jack toad. Yeah, I've spent many, many years working with that a jack toad. I have to say that the ones around Fortnite Point, I actually knew them all personally. Right? <laughs> Go out every night. It's not more than a bit of a bark in this fight. And I actually knew the toads. I just needed to get out more really. It was before I met my wife. Um, but you also get lots of fantastic um, plants and animals in this area. Um, Orchids, all kinds of things there, but one of some of the lower plants are fantastic. This thing here, Petalophyllum nalsii, Petalwort. This is a bryophyte, a liverwort. It's about a quarter the size of my fingernail. It hasn't been recorded on the Sefton coast for 40 years. I spent two or three years trying to find it. I went down to the museum, looked in the herbarium collection, but it's dried and flat. It didn't look anything like it would do in the wild. I took my wife, well, now my wife, and took her annual, annual to um, court a woman and asked her to come out and help me look for petal weight and the, the slacks and crawled around looking for it. I did actually find it in the end, um, and it's one of Britain's rarest plants, and it's the only, it's especially protected on the under schedules. So these wet slacks. Uh, oasis, great things, great with biodiversity hotspots. And maybe again, when our faith looks like that, there are times in our life when our faith is particularly rich. But it's in that landscape where it can be a bit stressful all the times. But those slacks are always there, those times, those hotspots are always there. And if we've got a healthy gene system, they will keep the care. When we get to the end of the mature genes, and again, Things like dune heath, heather, could just come into flowers, you know, purple rash of, of, of heather. A simple, floristically simple place, and yet one of the most valuable of all the dune habitats. Maybe our faith doesn't have to be complicated. Maybe our faith doesn't need, you don't need a doctorate in theology. Maybe you can keep it simple, and it can be equally as fun. Okay, now what I've done, I've taken you for a straight line walk through a sand dune with your boots on. Started at the beach, a walk to get land in a model. Okay. This is what we teach, what A-level students, O-level students, geography, biology are taught. And what this is, is what we call a Clementsian um, uh, ecological model. You can see, you start with that, you go through a series of stages, one thing follows the other over time. Does this really happen? Does 
this really happened in our lives, with our faith? Is it a straightforward continuum? You start here, and you follow a straight line, and you end up there. The reality is it doesn't work to happen like that. It's a useful model to introduce you to a complex thing. Because actually this is a model that we came up, one model we came up with, for dry dune succession, there's another one on wet dune succession, but I won't bore you with that. And you can see there, that's the clementia bit, the straightforward bit, but actually there's loads of feedback loops and um, interrelationships. It's not straightforward, it's beautifully complex. Beautifully complex. And this is just a model. This is as close as we can get. Life's like that, isn't it? Faith is like that. It's beautifully complex. And yet, at the same time, it's simple. So, we can think about that, that way of approaching difficult, hard to understand things. Here we are, something on the natural world. Something that is not just complex, but actually super complex. Super complex. But in our human frailty, we have to try and come up with models to try and understand this, to help us, to lead us, to bring us closer to understanding. So, we can have the Clementian model, or we can have the more complex model. Maybe we can think about that with our friend. Okay. Sand dunes are fantastic places, places that... Um, Loads of values, um, high values, nature conservation values, scenic values, recreation values, uh, etc. But they've got lots and lots and lots of pressures on them. A lot of this stems from people misunderstanding the dunes, the attitudes to them, uh, wastelands, places to be exploited. Therefore, you get built on them, you get developed, you get pine trees planted on them, you get the, min the sand mined, extracted. There was loads of that went on in the second coast. Yeah. Um, so there's a whole load of challenges you can see there that sand dunes face. And sand dunes are not in good condition. This is an assessment of all habitat, but broad habitat types in Europe. Okay. And the green is the proportion of the habitat that's in good condition, we call favourable condition. There's special ways of doing this in, in that we that, that we to assess the habitats. And what you can see is of all the habitats across Europe, sand dunes are the ones in greatest need. They've got the least amount of favourable condition. They've got a huge amount of unfavourable bad and unfavourable inadequate. They're in need. I'm a deacon. Deacons are supposed to address needs, poverty, hunger, go out and service. God's creation, the particular areas that are in need. Sand dunes are a particular need, top threatened habitat in Europe. But sometimes you've got to stand up against things that are not right. On two occasions I've um, been engaged by the Scottish statutory agency to stand up for sand dunes. The first one was in the early 2000s against that guy on the left. The many weeks proposal that was most interesting being for three weeks in a, effectively a courtroom in Aberdeen with Donald Trump and his colleagues. And then I said I wouldn't do it again, but they persuaded me back in 2019 to stand up against developing a, 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 another golf course in Cool Links in Scotland for another American family there. I've got nothing against Americans at all. But this wasn't right. This is pristine nature. This is something that's special, something that's threatened. So you've got to stand up for it. Maybe we need to do that in our faith. Sometimes we're tested, we're asked. You're challenged. If you stand there with a, those NQCs, they were to deliberately undermine you. You're not an environmentalist, you haven't got the credentials to try and you know, discredit your evidence. You've got to stand up and 
to say what's right and what you believe. And we have to do that with our faith as well. We're challenged, aren't we? Sometimes quite severely. Some people, as Christians, are basically to die for their faith still. But even on a day to day basis, perhaps we're challenged. We've got to stand up and say what's right and act and do what's right. And you have to do it before it's too late. This is in the Herbarium collection in the Liverpool Museum, um, in one of their folders, and it's a plant called Broad Leafed Century. Okay. It was a beautiful plant. There's lots of different centuries, lesser centuries, seaside centuries, but this is Broad Leaf Century. And it's beautiful, was a beautiful pink plant. It doesn't exist anymore. The last place it existed was basically where Crosby Marine now is. Yeah? Crosby Rabbit Warren, they called it. Right? And it was built up. And it's gone. And it doesn't exist anymore. It's like the dead dead. You can't bring it back. Okay. It only exists in a pressed collection in the Liverpool Museum. And there it is on the left. Okay. So sometimes we need to act before it's too late. And this goes into our attitude as Christians or the people of other faiths to our care and stewardship of the environment, to take action before it's too late. So when it's gone, it's gone. Okay. I'll move to a close. And we see, I'm going to go back to sand now, right? Because, remember what I said, you can't have sand dunes without sand. So therefore we're going to understand the sand. To understand the sand, we need to understand geomorphology. Okay. Um, and what we find is that topographically, the shape of dunes that are in Britain and across the north, most, much of northern Europe are over mature, they're too static. Right? They're too static. And all of them are subject to coastal erosion. And that's because the last time I looked, there were no new glaciers knocking around in Europe. Has anyone seen any? Well, so there's no new sand being produced. Right? So we've only got a finite supply of sand. And then going into erosion is just them adjusting to a new dynamic equilibrium. They've got to readjust themselves. Because we have to think about human influences and changes in sea level. So the dunes want to respond and change to the signs of the times. That's a bit of a laugh. Responding to the signs of the times. Some of you to do that, or want to do it, if we allow them. The other thing that's a problem with dunes is a lack of grazing. It used to be grazed by cattle and sheep, agricultural uh, practices, but that doesn't exist anymore. Times have moved on. And there also there were big rabbit farms. You can see that in the names of some dune systems like Newborough Warren. Broughton, Burrows, etc. They were rabbit farms. These rabbits, though, in 1950s, we introduced victimatosis and wiped out virtual rabbits. They're nowhere near that grazing pressure that they are now. And so, so the vegetation has grown up, the rabbits and the grazing kept it down, and because that vegetation has grown up, that creates that surface roughness where it seals the dunes off like fossilizes them. And then we make it worse by burning fossil fuels, throwing nitrogen up into the atmosphere, burning fossil fuels, which then rains down like fertilizer in these low nutrient environments, poisoning them, promoting this vegetation, stopping the sand moving. The sand moving is essential to the health of the dunes. But we didn't understand this. We didn't understand this until relatively recently. I got my first job as a coastal ranger in 1987. And we spent years fixing sand dunes, preserving them. We went out, we planted marrow grass on a grand scale. We put up sand trapping fences. We, I was one of the people who introduced to use them. Remember you were seeing those Christmas trees? They put them out on the, on the coast, right? So it's funny because we put them out. People always get phone calls after Christmas and people saying, 
You know those trees won't live because they haven't got any roots on them. <laughs> but they are not there for that. We spent loads and loads of time closing the sand dunes off, preserving them. There's a picture of me actually a few weeks ago in Aberfrau dunes on Anglesey. And I remember in 1887, I took a group of people for a week and fixed this big sand dune over there. It's still like that now. I'm horrified. Okay. I'm horrified because now we're opening things up, I wasn't going to say. Isn't that, like, isn't that like preservationist, inward looking, static view? Something that maybe some of our churches were. In the Catholic Church, we talk about Fortress Church. Cut off from the world outside. We need to be more mobile, outward looking. This is what we're doing with dune management now. Here's the book, the manual, How to Fix Dunes. I took that person around, Elizabeth Beckett, to help to write that book. Mm -hmm. The key thing is that sand dunes are wind driven systems, aeolian. Maybe the key thing then is the how we spend time. As we come towards Pentecost, to move us, to keep us alive in our faith. Sand blowing across the beach. What we realize is that this is the key, that moving the sand is the key to health and vigor. So now I've been part of two big projects, one in Wales, four million pounds, and one in England, ten million pounds. And what we're doing is this. Part of it, we're, we're opening up sand dunes to the wind, taking the vegetation off, and we're putting notches in the frontal dune system. Notches, holes, corridors. You can see an aerial photograph here. There's the beach, there's the back dune with notches put in. The idea is to connect the beach area where there's moving sand with the areas that are fossilised, that are dead, that are not moving, to get a geomorphological connection between them. What kind of notches do we need to put in our lives, in our faith? What kind of things do we need to let that, the Holy Spirit in? To move it into areas that are not available, or we've made unavailable. Maybe we need to take some that clear action. Let that, that wind blow through. So, what we see, some things to think about. Sand is important in our lives. People are important, sand's important, but sand's really important. So there's some things, the material, some material things are really important in our lives. Well, sand's really important. And that movement of sand in coastal dunes is essential to keep them healthy and alive. And you can see this diagram at the bottom. Don't worry about the writing. Look at the arrows. That's a dynamic dune. It's moving. It's alive. It's good. It's the wind's working on the material. It's healthy and vital. What can we do to do that? How can we have the wind blowing through our faith to keep it healthy and vital? Because the wind is the important thing. Sand, wind, and plants. Things. Sand and wind, you have sand first of all, you have faith first of all, and you've got to let the wind in, you've got to move that faith. But then the plants come in and modify it, create that surface roughness, create that, slow things down and create zones of stillness. Without that, the sand dune won't grow. Maybe in our faith, we need to slow down times and have times of stillness to allow for that growth. So all our genes are dynamic and balanced. So maybe our faith should be a dynamic and balanced. There'll be good patches, there'll be bad patches, there'll be rich areas like slacks, there'll be areas that maybe are, are not so diverse, but are equally important, even more valuable. Times of difficulty, times of change. Dune heat, not very diverse, really important. And our understanding of change and development of dunes continues to change and develop. That's just like our understanding of our faith. To finish off, all 
all this, um, all these kind of questions and journeys are only possible with people accompanying you, being with you, friends and family. There's a picture of me and my old relation with my wife Jane. Um, some people know Jane and the gorgeous old fella. She's it's a, a really important part of my life. So we all need someone, don't we? We all need someone. Especially if you're a boring scientist going on a beach. Because this is how I ruin family holidays at the beach. Okay. So most people view the, the, the vacation on a beach with a nice little pina colada and the sunshine on the bed. And here's me. Is that bird endemic? Um, look at the clouds. That's cumulus nimbus. There could be thunderstorms at 4 o'clock. Right? Um, there's a, look at the wavelength and frequency coming on on the shore. Look at the sediment moving down there. Look at the, the evaporation rate in that drink. Is that 32 degrees Celsius? Look at the pioneer. I'm a nightmare to go on holiday with. I'm an absolute nightmare to go on holiday with on the beach. Right? But we need people with us to round it up and to bring us back. Friends and family. So with that, I'd just like to say, with all those things, just remember, life's good at the beach, life's good with God. Thank you.